Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pastor Neil, and today my sermon, my keynote presentation is entitled, The Wander Years. There's a verse that I want to use in Numbers chapter 14, verse 22 to 23. It reads this, Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test, now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. When it comes to the wander years, I'm reminded of this movie. It is called, Are We There Yet? And in this movie, there's this young fella who meets this young gal and wants to get to know this gal. Spoiler alert, by the way. And as he's getting to know this gal, he finds out that this young girl has two kids. And they get to know each other. They go on some simple dates. And finally, it's time to meet the two kids. And of course, he wants to give a first impression. But of course, the kids, they don't, they're not really fond of him. And so they make it their goal to make his life miserable. But yet, he is determined to get to know their mother. So, the mother is in a dilemma one time, and she needs to fly out to a conference. But yet, for some reason, her sister, her the babysitter, cannot be available. And so, what a bright idea that this young man tells her, Oh, I could drive the kids to your conference and meet you there. And the adventure begins. I don't want to give too much, but let me just say that the entire ride from the house to the conference to meet up with the mom was not pleasant. They had to make many stops, and the question that always popped in the kids' heads were, are we there yet? And that's a question that we have as well. Are we there yet? Are we ready to be there? Are we ready for Christ's return? You see, in this story of the wander years, I reflect back on the people, the, the people of Moses, the Israelites. I look back and, and I remember that first of all, out of all the people, they should have put their trust in God the most. And it was frustrating and I could, and I could feel and see the frustration of God when they put him to the test. And so that's why he would tell Moses, number one, they have seen his glory and signs which he performed in Egypt and wilderness. Number two, they had put him to the test these ten times and not heeded his words. And number three, God finally said, they will certainly not see the land which I swore to their fathers. What was the real issue? Well, the real issue was that the Israelites were complaining. They were wandering for many, for many weeks, days, and yet they were complaining. And finally, God had to make a point, right? And the point that he had to make was, listen, I have been by your side. And what amazes me is that they had seen all these signs, all the glorious things that God had done. For example, we have seen twice that God had helped them in many instances from the seven plagues to get out of Egypt, from the crossing of the Red Sea. They had seen that wonderful miracle. Moses himself had seen God not once but twice through a burning bush and when he received the, the tablets the, of, of stones, the covenant laws. Yet they still complained. They still said, oh, are we there yet? Moses, come on, we've been wandering all these years. Are we there yet? And so, can you imagine being Moses, having to now uh, reassure the people of Israel? Yet, they still complain. Other things and miracles that they experienced, uh, bitter water made sweet, bread from heaven, manna, water from a rock, not once, but twice. And during the day when it was a hot, hot sun, there was a cloud that covered them. Wow. These amazing signs that reassured them that God was there. But yet God was finally frustrated and said, you know what? You are still complaining 
Therefore, I will hold back my promise to you. They had put God to the test. You see, not only they had put God to the test, it even got to the nerves of Moses. Moses, for example, when the people were uh, thirsty and arguing yet again, they said, Moses, we're thirsty, we're thirsty. But yet, God told Moses, take your rod and go to the rock with your brother in front of the congregation and speak to the rock. That was the first time. And then when he spoke to the rock, water came out and it quenched the thirsty Israelites. And the second time it happened. But this time Moses too was frustrated. He was upset again. Again, the people of Israel were whining and complaining because they were wandering all these years. Then finally, Moses out of his frustration said, okay, fine. Look, here's what we're going to do. Follow me. So instead of speaking to the rock, he then struck it with his staff, not once, but twice. Water did pour out, but that is not what Moses was supposed to do. And because of that, sadly, Moses would not enter the promised land. You see, when God tells you instructions, specific instructions, he wants you to follow it. In this instant, when Moses hit the rock, it was basically telling God, I trust in myself and no longer in you. So therefore, I'm going to take matters in my own hands, not yours. And so that's the consequence of what happened. They, he did not hallow God, meaning he did not honor and worship God through those actions. And it's very significant. So, of course, again, you see these Israelites people complaining and whining because they have now been wandering all these years. You know, God gives specific instructions, but we must listen to them. We must listen and trust in his guidance. Another example of the reasons why the Israelites wandered for years was when Moses had sent spies to go survey the land. And these spies were to come back and, and tell them, wow, it does flow with milk and honey. Mind you, these spies, each of them came from the 12 tribes of Israel. And so he went out there and sent them and yes, the land that they surveyed was full of milk and honey, but yet they had their doubts. Again, they had their doubts because they came and said, yes, the land is great, but there are mighty and tall, strong men and warriors. How can we defeat them? Not only one person spoke up at that time. It would be Caleb. Caleb would quiet the people amongst Moses. And he said, we can take it. God is with us. And yet some of the Israelites complained, oh, far it be better that we go back to Egypt. We go back to Egypt. And again, God, looking down from heaven, was again frustrated with what they were saying. So they talk about it once again. What shall we do? What shall we do? Well, here comes Joshua trying to um, support Caleb. He too tells the leaders of the, the Israelites, we can do this. We can do this. We can take the land. Then one final straw is because God at this point is just so frustrated. He, he finally tells uh, Moses, you know what? I am done. They will not see this land that I swore to their fathers for they have rejected me. And so Moses now has to intercede. And intercede means he has to talk on our behalf and the Israelites to God. And Moses is quite bold when he tells God, well, God, please be long-suffering. Please have grace. Please have mercy. Forgive us of our iniquities. But not only does he ask for forgiveness, he somewhat challenges God and tells and reminds God that if you do not allow us to go to the promised land, what will the rest of the nations and the kingdoms say about you? They might say, oh, 
They have this one God, and yet this one God could not help them to get through the wilderness? No, no, no. Please, Lord, please, God, listen to my prayer. Forgive the people of Israel. And so Moses' intercession on behalf of the Israelites was successful. But it would come at a cost. Yes, some people would see the land, Joshua and Caleb, but the rest of the older generations did not. That also included Moses. He would have to die first and then be resurrected, but only see a glimpse of the land from a distance. You see, when it comes to the wander years, in our own lives, do we just wander this path without even realizing that God is there? He's always been present. He wants you to be with Him day and night. He wants you to remember to trust in Him. Will you put your trust in Him? He challenged you. He's challenging you today. Will you put your trust in me? Even in the wilderness that you're wandering, even in your life, every day, will you put your trust in me? Before I conclude, I want to remind everyone that each and every day, it is a miracle for us. God has provided so many things, so many blessings in our lives. Let us not forget what God has done for you and for me. Let us not wander this world by ourselves, but put our faith and trust in God. God bless and take care. Hi, I'm Pastor David from Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church in Chetwin, BC, and it's a privilege to be able to share the, uh, the Word of God with you today. Um, here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about prayer. I want to ask a few questions around prayer. What is prayer? How do we pray? pray and, and how does pray, praying work? A simple definition would define prayer as, as talking to God. Now, now, prayer is not unique to, to Christianity. Um, most faiths uh, believe and religions have prayer incorporated in what it means to, to practice their faith. Um, I, I read a study even that said um, those who are even agnostic and, and unreligious um, at some point have prayed in their lives. So what sets apart prayer um, as Christians from every other prayer of, of every other religion? Well, it comes down to who we pray to and, and how we pray. Christians, we pray to the God of the Bible who is, is personal and active in our lives, who listens um, to our prayers and responds to our prayer. And we have the privilege to come before God, the God of our universe, the, the Lord of Lord and King of all kings, and, and be able to talk to him. But whatever you might be going through um, in your day, you may be, you're able to come and to talk to God. Now, the other thing that sets us apart is, is how we pray. And that's what Jesus is going to teach us today. So if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be going through verses 5 to 13, and I'll be reading from the CSB translation. It says this, Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be, to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they'll imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one i want you to notice this that that jesus teaches his disciples how to pray 
which is actually really good news. If, if prayer hasn't come naturally to you, um, prayer is something that is taught. It's something that we learn to do as followers of Christ. And even more significant is the fact that, that God is the one that teaches us how to pray to him. And he gives us a, a template. There's three things I want us to surface around prayer today is, is how we should not pray, how we should pray, and, and how does prayer work? And so I want to look at first, how should we not pray? In verse 5, it says, Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. So the first thing that we learn about prayer is that it's not a performance. It's not to impress others. It's not to show off or, or to come across as how holy and righteous we are. The motive of our heart is what matters here. When you come to prayer, ask yourself, am I doing this to be seen by others or am I doing this to be seen by God? When God is your only audience, you'll be able to be a lot more vulnerable with him and, and honest and sincere in what you're actually asking him because he's your only audience. So prayer, it's not a performance. The second thing that we're told not to do is in verse 7. It says, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. To babble is to uh, basically talk with no content or meaning behind it. To basically pray with no heart behind it. And Jesus says, just because you're saying words doesn't mean you're actually sincere in what you're asking God for. Instead, Christians were called to have a, a genuineness and intentionality and sincerity to our prayer. Doesn't mean you can't use other people's prayers. You can use the Lord's prayer as a template. You can use the prayers in the Psalms written by King David to, to pray as well. But those are, are powerful prayers that you can recite. But again, it comes down to your heart. Are you praying sincerely? And here's what I, what, what I want you to understand too, is, is that in verse eight, it says, your father in heaven knows the things that you need before you ask him. So God already knows what you need, which is comforting when, when you can't put words to, to what you're trying to get across to God, is that God already knows. So prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not babbling and, and rather it's, it's sincere and it's, it's honest. So then how do we pray? Well, first, Jesus starts by telling us where to pray. He says in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And the Father who sees in secret will reward you. So we're called to pray in, in secret. And it says that the Father will reward you in secret. Now, now what does that mean that the Father is going to reward you? Well, often he gives us more when we come to him in secret, he gives us more than we were ever expecting. A couple of years ago, I went to a, um, to a cabin in the woods on a solo prayer retreat. It was just me and God. And I went with all these, these sort of questions that I wanted God to answer in my prayer. And so I prayed and, and the problem was he didn't answer any of those questions. I got a little bit frustrated. So I started reading some scripture. And God revealed to me a verse that talked about who he was and as I went to prayer, he ended up filling up my soul with what I needed in that moment. And it wasn't for my questions to be answered. It was for me to understand more of who he was. And so I left feeling that place rewarded. God knew what I needed in that moment. And, and that was just more of him. So find that place where you can just be with you and the Father. And then when you do that, Jesus says, this is how you pray. He says, our Father in heaven your name be honored as holy. So Jesus starts by acknowledging the Father in heaven. And there's two things that that does. First, it reminds us of who God is, that he is personal, loving, caring, and Father. Second, by saying Father, it acknowledges the fact that we are his children, loved and accepted by him because of, of Christ's work on the cross. It was on the cross where Jesus died for our sins and restored our relationship with the Father. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, he adopts us as, as sons and daughters who now have access to the Father so that we can come to the Father and say, Our Father. Now, the second part of that line says, Your name be honored as holy. By acknowledging God's name as holy is to understand our separateness to God's majesty and incomprehensible greatness. It's a posture of worship towards God. It's saying, Father, in everything we do, we want to honor your holy and powerful name. Verse 10, it says, your kingdom come 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is our king and, and he has an eternal kingdom. And if you're a Christian, you belong to that kingdom. And so to pray that his kingdom come is to desire that God would establish his kingdom by adding more people to it and that he would return to establish his kingdom as the only kingdom that will go on forever. To pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is to pray that God's perfect purpose will be accomplished in this world as it already is in heaven. Verse 11, give us today our daily bread. It was Martin Luther who said, bread is a symbol for everything necessary for the preservation of this life, like food, like water, healthy body, a good weather, a home, a spouse, children, family, government, and, and peace. Bread is referencing the necessities that we, we ask for in life. And so this is where we can come and we can ask God for our personal needs. Our God provides for us and we, we don't need to worry. Everything we have is because God provides for his children. Verse 12 says, And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Jesus has forgiven us our debt of sin that we owe to God. He did that by going to the cross and dying for our sins and exchanging our unrighteousness for his righteousness. And we've been forgiven. And, and Jesus says, um, you also need to forgive others. As much as you've, been, you've received mercy, you also need to extend mercy. Verse 13, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that God tempts us. It is the evil one who tempts us. This is the call for God to protect us because we're weak, for God to deliver us because we don't have the strength, for God to be our help and we cannot um, persevere over evil by ourselves. By nature of praying that stanza, you're realizing your dependence on God in the face of evil. God is the one that's going to deliver you. So that's how Jesus teaches us how to pray. He says it's not a performance. It's not babbling on. Rather, it's sincere and it's, it's honest. Now, I want to ask the question, how does prayer work? Like what happens when we pray? There's two things. First, it can change outcomes. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. What that means is failure to ask actually deprives us of what God would have otherwise given to us. And sometimes we don't get things because we just never asked. And it's not that God didn't know that we, we needed or wanted something. It's just that we never asked. So prayer can make a difference in situations. We're called to come to the Father in prayer. Second, and more importantly, is that prayer changes us. Richard Foster, who wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline, says this. He says, in quote, to pray is to change. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. If we are unwilling to change, we will abandon prayer as a noticeable characteristic of our lives. The closer we come to the heartbeat of God, the more we see our need and the more we desire to be conformed to Christ. So prayer, it, it changes us. It conforms us into, uh, into Christ. Prayer is where we begin to think God's thoughts after him, where we begin to desire the things that he desires and we love the things that he loves. As we pray with humility and an openness to change, he teaches us things from his point of view. So prayer can change outcomes and prayer can change us. Now I want to finish today by addressing a, a common question that I hear. Why hasn't God answered my prayer? And some of you are here today and you've prayed and prayed and and it feels like God hasn't answered your prayer. And so there may be a number of reasons. The writer Grudem wrote this. He said, sometimes prayer goes unanswered because we do not always know how to pray as we ought, which is Romans 8.26. We do not always pray according to God's will, which is James 4.3. And we do not always ask in faith, which is James 1.6-8. And sometimes we think that one solution is best, but God has a better plan, even to fulfill his purpose through suffering and possibly even hardship. And so our call as Christians is to trust and believe in faith that God has heard our prayer, but he might not answer it how we think he might answer it. It was Pastor Tim Keller who said this wise statement. He said, God will either give us what we ask for in prayer or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knows. God knows best and he will answer prayer according to his perfect will. And it might not be what you thought it would look like. 
And so trust that God will answer your prayer. So here's my challenge for you today. Spend time praying to God. Use the, the Lord's prayer as a, as a template and, he, and, and believe that he will hear you and that he will answer you. So let me finish by praying the Lord's prayer. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. visual presentation to allow people to see kind of what happens. Obviously it's no roof collapsing and windows smashing, but it gives you an idea as to, you know, if you have a rollover, the windows are gonna blow out and you're pretty much, if you're not wearing a seatbelt, you're probably, the likelihood of being ejected is great. So, which, you know, you can be crushed by the vehicle when, uh, you know, the vehicle keeps rolling if you're flung towards the motion of where the truck is going or where the vehicle is going. You could get crushed by that vehicle. You could get thrown the opposite way and be 30, 40 feet away from the vehicle and we not, might not find you for a while. Um, I Last year I had somebody that was ejected, not wearing a seatbelt, roll over, fell asleep. And he was found 40, 50 feet from his vehicle and he was out there for three, four hours by himself before he was uh, located and he's now a paraplegic and he's 19 years old. So these things do happen. Remember me, I'll remember.